Node.js or whichever, and why, why do you care about how a CPU works, right? So I'm going to show you that it's actually pretty relevant no matter where uh, you actually are. And uh, we, sh we saw that Brendan Eich showed uh, WebAssembly uh, is coming. So it helps also to understand WebAssembly if you understand a little bit how the uh, assembly that you know, basically you write for CPUs works. And um, I actually wrote a tool that makes it easier for you to learn um, assembly language. So I'm going to show you a little bit, and that also runs in the browser, so I'm going to demo that a little bit for you. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story, how I even got to, to do this, so, so you can see that you can do it too. You can also learn these, these things. So why should anyone learn assembly? Well, assembly basically gets you as close to the CPU as you can get, unless you want to write zeros and ones. Did any one of you uh, ever get these magazines like for Atari and you wrote these FF0, F, these, these opcodes in there? Maybe I'm too old, okay. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, you could write zeros and ones or you could write opcodes, so, uh, but that's a little too, too much. So assembly gets you there, but it won't kill you. So uh, assembly is very close to, to, uh, um, to the CPU. So you can still see how the CPU actually works uh, without, you know, but you, so basically the thing is that a CPU, if you write JavaScript, right, and you give that to the CPU, it doesn't understand what is going on, right? A CPU does not understand JavaScript. It doesn't understand assembly either, or it doesn't understand C. It has to be first, uh, translate it into zeros and ones. But you don't want to write them because to you, zeros and ones look like gibberish, right? Or well, it's really hard to understand. And actually, there used to be people who wrote actually opcodes back, way back in the days, but it's very hard and very slow. So assembly is kind of one step up, but, but still really close to the CPU. And, and if you do that, it, it will teach you how CPU works, right? Because uh, you see exactly, when we're going to look at some instructions later on in the demo, you see exactly, oh, I'm doing this, one thing, and the CPU changes this way. And then I do this thing, and it changes this way. So it's, it's one, st one step at a time, and you can understand each step, what actually happens in the CPU. So if you want to kind of see, you know, get a little lower and see what's actually happening in the computer, this is the way to go. Um, here we have an uh, example. Um, we're actually, we're using um, assembly language in Node.js, right? Because if you need to write code that is highly performant, sometimes even the C compiler will not generate the best code. Actually, the uh, GCC, C compiler, uh, writes assembly first and, and then basically uh, translates it into machine code later. Uh, but sometimes it's not generating the best assembly that you want, right? So this one, I had this actually explained to me this one basically uh, ensures that we can swap a variable without having to do a lock, so which, which is uh, a huge improvement for performance. And uh, in Node, since the code runs a lot, it makes a huge difference. So if this runs like a 1,000 times a second or more, uh, a little a performance gain makes a huge difference. And in that case, you actually need to understand a little bit about CPUs and assembly to, to do that. Uh, so here we have an example. Uh, of some assembly code. And the cool thing is that uh, since it's so close, you can translate them back and forth. So has anyone used source maps before? Yeah, so lots of you. So basically, if you minify your code, right? If it's minified and you don't have source maps, there's no way to translate it back to the original. Like that information is lost, right? The same way if you uh, compile a C program, right? Uh, or a C++ or something else, uh, it wouldn't be able to translate it back into the same, um, the, the C++, right, when you're debugging, without having some debug symbols in there. So that's how the compiler basically does it. It puts these bug symbols in there so you can translate it back. However, in assembly, we don't even need that. Since assembly is so close, you can always go back and forth. So for instance, in this case, we have B8. And B8 always means move. So we, we know, okay, so this is B8, so someone wrote move in their assembly program. And then uh, we are moving this value. Actually, in this case, B8 actually move into, it means move into AEX. So there are certain optimizations where, oh, we're moving into AEX a lot because it's the accumul accumulator. So B8 means move into AEX, and then the number afterwards is what we are moving into it. 
And this is also uh, probably a quick, uh, good point to explain. So what this does, it, uh, you have the destination register and you have a source operand. So that's basically how this always works in assembly. And the re result of whatever you're doing gets stored in the, in the destination. So uh, here, for instance, we have add. So we're adding one to EAX. So we'll take whatever was in EAX, it will add one to it, and then it will write it back to EAX. So we don't, we don't rewrite it, we don't assign it to other variables. That's, that's how it's in assembly. But basically, uh, 83 means add. Uh, actually, this 83 means it's a little more complex, but C0 means add to EAX. But basically, the idea is that you can always, always translate it back, right? Actually, not that hard. So I, I did not really know assembly very well until about a year ago. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit how I got there. So first of all, I went to La Universidad at some point. And I studied computer science. And I also had this course, um, Computer Organization and Design. Does anyone read this book before? It's a really good book. Um, it actually teaches you uh, assembly on, on a risk processor, like a re reduced instruction set. Uh, it was really good, and I could have probably learned a lot at the time, but unfortunately, I was really into jazz guitar, and I wanted to be as good as this guy. So I kind of went to class and did the minimum I had to do, um, but I went home and practiced guitar. So I didn't really, I think I got a D plus in the class, which for non-Americans is not that good. So um, I didn't learn that much. But later on, I came back to programming. But the thing is that I started with Microsoft.net. And that's really, really high up in the stack, right? So um, you also may think, like, oh, I'm really high up in the stack. I'm writing front end. I'm using React. I'm using Angular. How, how am I ever going to learn this, all this stuff down there? Well, I was in the same boat. Um, but then I wanted to be one of the cool kids. So I learned Node.js in my free time. And I played with it. And it's actually already really low. And like you can already see, like, oh, I'm creating a server. And you can actually, you know, if you want to dig further, you can dig into Node.js and you can see everything that's happening. So it's, a little, it's actually a lot lower already. Uh, but it, it wasn't low enough for me. So I started to learn C. And that was about uh, two years ago. So not that long ago. I mean, I had learned C at some point also in school. But as I said, I wasn't paying too much attention. So I, you know, I relearned C. Uh, just to understand, and C is already a uh, solo level that uh, you can almost um, understand, like, okay, this statement will be translated into this kind of assembly. It's, it's, it's very low level. You can access the memory directly, uh, and so on. So that's, that's a really good step to get down there. And then everyone knows, at least Germans will know, that C and A goes together. It's kind of an insider joke. So the Germans have to laugh now. The two Germans that we have here. <laughs> So once I had C, I also wanted to learn assembly, right? So I got me this book, and I highly recommend it. Um, and I just walked through this book. Like, I just read it step by step. Um, and, and I went through the examples, and I just coded them up, and I worked with it, and I understood it, and uh, kind of <laughs> enough to, to have fun. It's actually, this is the thing. You should, it's all fun. I didn't do this because you know, uh, you know, I forced myself to do it. I just wanted to understand it, and it was a lot of fun to do. And then, of course, the next step is to write something. So the typical thing is you write a Pong game, right? So this got kind of halfway done. And, um, but when it was kind of halfway done, I, uh, I kind of realized I'm not going to learn anything anymore by finishing it. And I don't really think that the world needs another Pong game in assembly. Um, and the, but what I also did there is, since I was already doing Node and I was used to uh, NPM, I made sure that I wrote all these functions in a very in a very modular manner. So, so for instance, here we have nz cursor height function. And you can go there and you can read through the code. So I made, I made a bunch of functions that you can reuse, kind of like NPM, but for assembly. So, so that, that was interesting. Um, and, and basically, if you want to learn about assembly, uh, read other people's code. And this is actually kind of nice. I also found other people's uh, functions that I read through and I try to understand it. Um, so these are really, really uh, short. And, and they usually explained. I try to explain them very well. So you can, you can use this to also uh, understand assembly a little better. So, so, OK, so I said, 
Uh, Pong game, I won't do a Pong game, so what, what will I do? Right? I was thinking, how could I learn more about this? But also I wanted to actually help others because I thought, you know, it could be a little simpler. There are not enough, uh, you know, simple tools out there to learn this and make it uh, easily approachable. So uh, I, I looked about and I saw a lot of CPU emulators, like, you know, for Game Boy, or there's a Linux running in the browser and so on. But then I thought, okay, the world doesn't need another one of those either, but maybe the world needs one that actually um, visualizes what's going on in CPU. So you can just go through your assembly program and you can understand what's going on. So, and I know this is kind of getting boring. We're gonna get to the demo in a second. But what I did is uh, I basically wrote Visualator. But before I can show you that thing, I have to uh, explain a little bit about how the CPU works. Uh, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So basically, uh, we, we have a control unit, and this is a simplified CPU. There are way more things going on, but uh, this is, you know, even I don't understand all these things, even after like looking at them for a long time, but this is a simplified way. So we have the control unit, which kind of controls what's going on. And what it will do, it will look at the instruction register, and the instruction register will tell it where to read the next instruction from, right? And the, remember the opcodes we saw before, like these weird numbers? So it goes there and it reads numbers, and it reads number 88. And then it knows number 88 means, oh, I have to do this. And then it may read more things from memory because it, you know, it may need like the input values or what register I'm working with. And then it figures out what to do. And then it tells the ALU, which is the arithmetic logic unit, what to do. So it sends signals to the ALU. The ALU will basically read values from the registers. And, and then something will happen. And in the end, some register has another value. That's basically how it works. And the CPU itself doesn't have any memory. In the CPU, we only have registers. And if it needs to actually read from memory, it first goes to the memory, puts it in a register, and then it operates on it. So it can never directly operate on memory. So now, Okay, so I have an example down here. I hope it's readable. So in this case, um, add ECX, uh, add, add one to it, so we'll say, okay, it found the add instruction. Okay, this is a register ECX. What's in it? Give it uh, tell the ALU to use ECX and also use one, and then ECX changes. That's basically how it works. Very simple, like every step is actually very, very simple, as we'll see in a moment. And then there are other instructions like OR. So now we're actually gonna really do the demo. So this is a visualator. So I want to explain a little bit about it after I had a zip of water. So on the very bottom, on the left here, uh, we see the opcodes. That is actually what the CPU consumes. That's what the CPU understands. It looks like gibberish to you, right? Looks like gibberish to me too. Um, and basically, that's what uh, it tells to be what to do. And up here, we have um, the disassembled version. Like I said before, we can take these opcodes and translate them back into assembly. And so here, for instance, we have, okay, B8, FF, bloop, all this stuff means move this number into EAX. And then the control unit will go ahead and do that, right? So that's, so on the left, we see the program. And on the right, we see all the visualizations. So. Is this big enough, by the way? Bigger? Bigger? Okay, let me see if that works. Good? All right, so, so here we, on, on, the, on the right side here, we have the registers. So we have uh, EAX, EBX, uh, this is an x86 architecture, so it's 32-bit, so that's why we have all these registers with E. If you had 64-bit, they would start with R and would be bigger. And each register has 32 bits. And each register here is, is, is shown twice. So one time we show it in binary, and then we show it in hexadecimal. So basically here we have zero in binary, and then again we have zero in hexadecimal. And each register can also be addressed uh, in, uh, in smaller parts. So for instance, we can just address the lower byte of, of, uh, of EAX, and that's called AL. We can also address the, uh, this byte here. You can actually not directly address it, but it would be called uh, actually, you can address it directly. It's called a AH. And then you can uh, address these both together, the lowest uh, uh, two, two bytes with, with at AX. And the whole thing together is EAX, right? So that's kind of how this works. So for instance, here we have move BL. 
So then we're actually like moving into, into this uh, lower part here. Uh, and down here we have a bunch of help and instructions, and then here we have the flags, right? And the cool thing is that you can actually click on these things. So if I click on it, it will tell you that this is an interrupt and able flag, so my CPU claims that it, it, it can handle interrupts. Um, by the way, this is the, there's a real CPU emulator running here, so this is not smoke and mirrors, it's actually really behaving kind of like the real CPU. Um, so, so now what I can do is I can, I can uh, step, and now we can see if I do that, we can see how the EAX changes, right? So you see the animation there? And also watch the instruction pointer here. This one here is pointing to 100, right? Because we are at the address 100. If I step, the instruction pointer will now point to 105 because we just, we just jumped to that instruction. So now the CPU knows to read from there for the next instruction, right? Um, another thing to, uh, to note is, like down here we have a simulation, so I'm gonna try to do this again. So down here, it shows you how the binary addition works, right? So we are, we are about to add one to EAX, and this is how it works, right? It'll, it'll basically uh, keep, keep adding this like that, and, the, and you can see up here the carry, carries all the way over, and uh, it will basically f fall off in the end. And once we execute it, well, we'll see basically that we're gonna set this, this, uh, the, lowest, the highest bit here. It's gonna become one, right? Because the carry went all the way there, and now if we actually execute this, we'll see that these flags got set, right? We can see like, okay, if I go back, so here you can see how the flags change. So the sign flag got set. So what's the sign flag do? Well, if the first, the highest bit is one, that's basically when the sign flag is set. So we can see that. And what are the flags for? Well, the flags are, so you can basically make decisions, or like you can make jumps, so you can say, you know, go here if the sign flag is set. Or you can make a loop and say, count down uh, from 10 to zero, and once it is zero, uh, jump out of the loop or so on. Um, so you can basically um, play with this and go back and forth. And I have actually jumps implemented. Unfortunately, the UI cannot handle it at this point. So, uh, I'm, I'm continuously improving this, and I hope that maybe after this talk, some people of you get interested and help me. Um, but uh, what else can I show? So oh, one, one cool thing to notice is that uh, the, the disassembler is actually using capstone. Uh, has anyone seen capstone before? Capstone is like this is disassembler framework, and, and there's an mscript version. Uh, Ren and I uh, showed, talked about mscript in a little bit. So there's actually a version that compiled to JavaScript uh, and, and this runs in the, in the browser. So I'm actually taking the opcodes and converting them back into, into, into assembly and I can show you the assembly. Um, another interesting thing that you can do is if you want to understand how add works, you can just click on the link and it will go to, uh, to the um, information so you can learn about this. So this is all about trying to help you, uh, a little, you know, get a little better start than I had because I had to do this all by hand and I couldn't play with things. So it's supposed to help you just play with this in the browser and kind of understand how this works. All right. So before I get to the resources, um, as I said, there's a real CPU running in here, right? And, and you might say, well, how do you know that your CPU is actually working correctly, right? Well, I'll tell you, I have 100, uh, I have like uh, 27,000 tests. So they're gonna run right now. So right now, basically, I'm, I'm just starting off the testing here, and in a second, it will go through this. And it's 20,000 tests. And at this point, you probably think, this guy is crazy. Like, 27,000 tests? You have nothing else to do? Um, yes, I do have something else to do. So I didn't write these tests by hand. Because what I thought about was, okay, um, how would I know that my CPU behaves correctly, right? It's an x86 architecture. Well, I have, I'm in, in a Linux virtual machine right now, I have a x86 CPU right here, right? And I know it must behave correctly, otherwise nothing would probably work. So why don't I just run my code through that CPU, and then I record what the register values are at each step, right? And then if, if I know what the register values are, I can kind of feed them into my CPU, I can feed the opcodes into my CPU, and then I can check that my CPU has the same register values every time, 
and then I know it's behaving the same way, and then I know it works, right? So basically, I wrote this thing uh, called GUI. It stands for GDB Assembly Informant. Uh, it's kind of like a little pun on KGB. But basically what it does, it, um, it actually makes this a little bigger. Well, we're gonna actually show this in the demo, but basically what it does, has anyone worked with GDB before? GDB is the debugger, right? I highly recommend, if you're, trying to, if you're going to learn assembly, um, you use GDB because uh, with GDB you can basically step through, through your assembly code one, one step at a time, you can look at what happens. And that's how you kind of understand how it actually works. So, um, and that's basically what, what Guy does. So Guy basically takes a, a, you know, a compiled program and then it, it makes GDB step through it. GDB will, will print out the register values they basically wrote a script for that. And then it parses that and puts it into a JSON file. And that JSON file then becomes my input to my, to my tests. And then I'm gonna show that in a second. Um, but basically you can also, um, so basically what I can do, uh, this, this file here, I'm gonna say it in Spanish, is that correct? No, <laughs> hota, right? Okay, whatever, I tried. So this one is basically testing that jumps, uh, conditional jumps work correctly. Like if, uh, basically if it jumps, if it's zero, it will jump or it won't jump if it's not zero and so on. So basically what I can do, I can feed it this binary and then I can print out what, what it does. So, so here we can see now that um, basically every, every step, what, what changed, right? So when I moved one into ECX, well ECX changed to one, right? We can see that on the right side. And, and, and kind of, I can see here how the flags change. So for instance here, we were testing if the last test was, was zero, and if it was, we would have jumped to start dot zero, to that label, right? But since it wasn't, because ECX is one, right? So then it doesn't jump yet. Then it goes here, and then now we're moving zero into ECX, and we're doing the same test again. Well, at that point, we can see that ECX was zero, right? And then uh, when I now do the test, my zero flag got set. That's basically how this works in assembly, right? So zero flag got set, and now it jumps, and it will now jump, and the next ad address here, we, we are at, at zero, start zero, right? So I can understand how, how the CPU actually really works. I can read this, and, and I can kind of make my CPU work that way, and then I can take these JSON files. So basically, what it generates is, is this kind of JSON, um, where I have each step, and it will tell me basically what are the register values, right? So I know, I know what my CPU needs to, what basically the CPU needs to look like after I do the operation. And then I have that for every step. And at the very bottom I have the opcodes. So I feed these opcodes to my CPU, and then I compare uh, the, the register values to the ones that I recorded, and if everything is the same, it works. So all I have to do is basically write assembly in order to write new tests. So, for instance, this is the one I showed you. This is the one with a conditional jump. And basically what I'm saying here is, I say, guys, start here, start recording here, and then end over here. And in the middle I write some assembly. I can comment in it, and that's basically how I write my tests. I don't have to write tests by hand at all. Otherwise, I would probably not be here. I would still be in some little, in the basement somewhere, trying to write these 27,000 tests. Okay, so, I, highly rec I hope I got you inspired with this talk to, to try this. It's really not as hard as it seems. Like to me, it was like, oh, I'm never gonna get there. I don't know, you just try it, you know, good books, and, and, and hopefully Visualator will, will become better. I'm, I'm still working on it, I'm still trying to improve it, and, and uh, you know, there are tools out there. GDB is improving, so I'm gonna show you some things that, that you can use to get started, that I find, find useful. So first of all, this, this book that I kind of read in school but never really paid attention, it's a good book. Um, the GDB debugger, um, just play with it a little bit. Uh, also, on, uh, if you're on Mac, you can use LLDB. However, that doesn't play very well at the moment with uh, assembly programs, unfortunately. So it's actually better if you're on Linux and you're using GDB. Uh, then there's this uh, awesome plugin. I'm just gonna show this. This is a plugin for GDB. And it will basically show you things like this. So it will, it will show you the register values. And actually, visually, I got kind of inspired by this. It's just trying to make it more accessible, so it basically runs in the browser. Um, it is a reverse engineering tool, but you can also use it for good, so. 
Uh, then GDB assembly informant is a tool I wrote, which probably you could also use, uh, you know, you compile your programs and you, you run that against it and you understand what's happening each step. It's kind of like a, a debugger, a logging debugger, you could think of it that way. Really interesting to look at is, is the whole capstone stuff. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things are going on there. A lot of tools are being built on top. So that's really, really interesting to, to look at uh, what's going on there. As I, as I said, reading little functions and kind of understanding them and maybe debugging through them uh, in assembly, it helps you understand how this works. So uh, this is my collection of, of little uh, assembly functions. Obviously, visualator is interesting. Uh, then I try to really uh, document uh, everything I did very well. So if you look at the visualator readme, um, it explains kind of how the CPU works, um, or like how, how the CPU that I wrote worked with the, the, the emulator. And, and I also d discuss some things that a real CPU will do that mine doesn't do, and so on. So you can kind of get an idea here. Um, and then whoever is interested, if you go in here and you see this x86 86 folder, if you put an ARM folder in there, for instance, and you implement it, then Visualator will be able to uh, simulate uh, or emulate an, an ARM CPU. So you could, you know, if you're interesting in, uh, interested in doing Raspberry Pi, maybe, you could try to do that. So I'm looking for people that, that help with that. And obviously, you know, WebAssembly is coming, so I don't know if you can do something there. Um, but basically, that's why I put the folder there, so there will be more folders in the future that you guys create. All right. And that's it. Thank you. Follow me on Twitter if you're interested. <laughs>